Okay, um, I think we can get started now. Um, welcome everybody to the third Hyperscience Learn lecture of 2021, um, First Steps in ML with PyTorch. Um, this, sec this section we're going to be uh, evaluating a model with uh, Danny Balchev and Christo Minkoff. Um, for those of you unfamiliar with hyperscience, we are, um, we, uh, our goal is to connect human and artificial intelligence uh, to create better outcomes for customers um, and companies around the world. Um, we were founded in 2014 and we've grown incredibly rapidly since then. Um, now we have uh, 300 plus employees, I believe now it's uh, 340, uh, and we have offices in uh, New York, Sofia, and London. And um, through this hyperscience platform, um, em enterprises are empowered to uh, transform their data, their operations, and uh, drive operational efficiency, as well as human productivity to be fully unlocking uh, the power of their data. Um, now, for those of you who haven't joined uh, the last two sessions, um, what is Hyperscience Learn? Um, Hyperscience Learn actually started roughly uh, four years ago, um, and we brought it back uh, this year due to um, high demand. And the goal of Hyperscience or, or Hyperscience Learn was inspired by um, our desire to spread our enthusiasm, our knowledge, um, and our expertise about ML and artificial intelligence among the larger uh, tech communities. Um, and we want to basically share and increase our knowledge um, amongst these communities. Um, it's geared towards all levels. So whether you're a software, whether you're an ML specialist to students looking to potentially uh, work in the ML field after graduation, uh, software uh, developers with no dedicated experience who want to learn more about ML, um, where we're sure you could find something that, that interests you within these presentations. Um, and future topics will be driven by the community. So we'd love your feedback. We have a Google form that we circulate at the end of this for your kind of your tips and ideas. Um, so we'd love your feedback on what to focus on um, in later sessions. Um, this is actually our, our, our last session for a couple of months. We're gonna take a break for the summer. Um, but we are going to come back uh, in a couple of months stronger and better than ever. Um, so, uh, but during the session, feel free to ask questions, drop them in the chat. And uh, Christo and Danny will uh, jump right in and answer those at the end of the session. Um, so without further ado, I will pass it over to my colleagues, uh, Danny and Christo. Hello, I'm Daniel. Uh, I'm a staff engineer at Hyperscience. I have uh, three and a half years tenure in the company. And uh, before that, and so my education is in artificial intelligence. I have a master's degree there. Uh, I'm also a regular contributor of our tech block at Hyperscience. And my interests outside of work include other machine learning applications, AI and tech ethics, and uh, more broadly, again, theory as well. Uh, short intro from my side as well. Uh, my name is Christo Minkov or Christo II, for those of you who have seen the previous uh, Hyperscience Learn session. Um, I do have a related degree in data science and artificial intelligence. I also work as a back end data generation engineer at Hyperscience, which would mean that I generally look into the data that go to our models and make sure it has a good impact on the performance of the model. Uh, similar to Danny, uh, my interests evolve mainly around machine learning applications, but also often curious about the meaning behind the real meaning behind the data, and of course automation, or put simply, how we can uh, save some more uh, some more time uh, when dealing in uh, real life. And that's it. Uh, I'll bring it back to Danny. Okay, thank you, Christo. So let's go quickly over the agenda today. Uh, first, we're going to look at the machine learning project lifecycle. Then we're going to discuss the evaluation goals for a machine learning project and how we do that with empirical testing. Uh, then we'll look at uh, some metrics like accuracy and others. And uh, at the end, uh, we'll discuss how, uh, how and why we, we use baselines. 
then matrix then uh, Christo we're going is going to ask our matrix enough uh, tell us about the train and test set and uh, discuss the data set split problem then he's going to talk about underfitting and overfitting and at the end he's going to summarize into model evaluation takeaways so let's let's start uh, last time uh, Chris and the other Christo showed you how to train your model but even though deep learning is very focused and focused on the training itself and the model architecture used in that training there are so so much uh, stuff other in that process and so actually going to let's see what what's out there except the training itself before we start a new machine learning project we have to analyze the task we're going to solve like uh, see uh, what is the goal, what are the inputs to the system, uh, how it fits into the broader system, and uh, so, so on. Then we need to gather the data and prepare it so we can train the model on that data. And this is a very laborsome process, especially if we don't have a ready-made data set. Then it's the actual tr uh, training the model itself, which, uh, which was the focus for a previous presentation. And then it's the evaluation and analysis step. We're going to focus mainly on the on the evaluation here, but uh, the analysis is also a very important part. And the next step it actually depends on the analysis. Uh, it's usually repeating some of the steps before, for example, uh, adding more data, changing the model we're training, or even uh, tweaking the task we, we need to solve uh, altogether. So let's zoom into the evaluation and first look at what is the goal of that evaluation. Uh, basically, we want to verify that uh, our, our model will provide value. And uh, so it makes sense to move it uh, to the next steps of uh, development and deployment or figure out where, it, where it's lacking uh, the value it can provide. Uh, it's also useful to come uh, to compare it versus uh, other models, uh, other approaches, or even not solving the task at all, and uh, evaluate. That's also part of the evaluation process. And uh, based on those comp comparisons, it makes sense to compute what, to figure out what are the next steps we're going to do in our development cycle. Uh, since this is machine learning, we, we cannot prove our model is going to work. It's actually uh, not perfect, uh, almost by definition. So uh, we cannot uh, pass one example, and if it's correct, uh, figure out that, um, verify that our model is uh, complete, and we can move uh, move on with uh, our development. No, we have to use uh, very strict empir empirical testing to figure out that. Uh, our model is doing and it's basically running our model on some data and computing some metric uh, and let's we're going to zoom in on those two steps first i'm going to zoom into the the metric part of uh, this process and crystal is going to tell us how to run it on some data you know in order to that to make that evaluation make sense and uh, how to design that process so metrics uh, metrics are a way that quantify the the value that uh, my mod that our model provide. Uh, it's different than a loss function in some ways. Uh, first, the loss function is a bit constrained. It has to be differentiable, and that usually makes it not human interpretable. Interpretable. For example, in our previous lecture when we were training our model. Uh, it's not interpretable to say what is uh, 0 0.1 on 0 0.5 uh, uh, soft max or or cross entropy and uh, that's uh, because that's not part of the design of a loss function but uh, the metrics don't have to be differentiable so it can use uh, more uh, uh, more tightly aligned with our goals metrics that are more human interpretable and so uh, we'll see that how to interpret the values of the metrics we see in the later slide after we give some examples of the metrics and actually another uh, question that might come to mind is why do we need metrics all together? Why can't we just compare the ground truth value to the pr prediction value and uh, call it a day? And yeah, this actually makes a lot of sense. And this is uh, the 
most trivial metric, which is called accuracy. And it's basically that we're measuring current or estimating the probability that our model is giving the correct prediction. And here is uh, a very easy formula that will take that will compute that for for one batch of calculation. And actually, let's uh, see how how to compute accuracy in in a demo. I've prepared a notebook here that uh, is uh, getting uh, get, getting a lot of its code from uh, the notebook uh, Chris and Chris to present it last time and. Uh, Let's see how we can integrate accuracy in this notebook. Uh, first, some uh, some reintroduction. This is the 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 neural network that uh, we trained last time, and this is uh, the uh, the data sets we get we got last time, like the MNIST data set that uh, uh, we. We use the neural network to tell us what is written on in this image. It's a collection of images. Uh, and here we get the training quarters as we did last time. And uh, this is a training loop as we did last time with one small uh, change. Uh, uh, except uh, uh, logging the uh, loss of the model, we're going to uh, log the accuracy as well. And actually, I'm going to run it uh, from from the start, it's a pretty quick notebook. So after we uh, log our, we, while we log our accuracy, we can see how it changes during the training. And we can see that in step zero, it's uh, burial above 10%. Uh, it actually makes sense that it's not 0%. I'm going to explain in, in a few minutes why this is the case. And we can see how it uh, increased from 50% to 8% to 94%, but then it drops back to 84% again. And we can see uh, some back and forth here again. And uh, the most uh, common case why this happens is uh, because we're measuring the accuracy on a single batch. We're not measuring on a whole data set. So we have uh, some sampling error in the way we're in, in the examples we're using for measuring the accuracy. And some batches are inherently easier than others. Uh, so let's measure the accuracy on the whole data set. To do this, I've written a small function that uh, counts how many samples we have and how many of those samples we got correctly. This is, uh, again, by the, the definition of accuracy. And uh, we're going to use this since usually we don't have enough memory to load the whole data set in, in memory. And we use uh, tricks like this to measure the accuracy. So for each image and target in the te test data set, we run the, the network. We see the predictions using the ArcMax function as Chris showed last time. And then we count how many samples we have in the batch and how many of those samples we got correct. But instead of using the mean, we use the sum since uh, this uh, target equals uh, predictions gives us a Boolean mask that's uh, true when, when we're right and false when we're, we're not. We convert it to a float where we got uh, one where we're right and zero when we're not. And uh, when we sum this vector, we get uh, how many times we're correct. And so to compute the accuracy, we basically divide how many times we're correct over the whole data set uh, by the number of samples we have. And uh, let's integrate this into the training loop again and do it initially before we the model is trained and at the end of each epoch. And we can see that our accuracy starts from around 10%, jumps to 88% at the second uh, after the first epoch and then at 92% after the, the second, the third one. So, Let's dive a bit deeper here, and we will use a, a, a tool called a confusion matrix for this. And, uh, and to explain how what is a confusion matrix, I'm going to show one. It's basically a matrix with uh, the number of that's a square matrix that has uh, a number of uh, classes on both uh, its axes. And it basically tells us how often we predict a given class and when the true uh, label is a different, the same or a different class. For example, in this small example here, we predicted zero times uh, 
uh, the quad zero when the actual label is zero. We predicted one time uh, one when the actual label is zero, and we predicted two times one when the actual label is one. And uh, to build a confusion matrix, we use the confusion matrix function from a scalar matrix. And so we again pass uh, a vector that tells us what is the correct class and a vector that tells, tells us what is the predicted class. For example, if in the first sample, the predicted, predicted class is zero, the true class is zero, but we predicted one. In the second one, the, the true class is one and predicted one as is in this sample here. That's why we have two here and so on. And let's uh, plot a confusion matrix uh, for our training set as well, uh, for our evaluation, sorry, as well. And uh, to, we actually can do a cumulative confusion matrix, like start with a matrix that's all zeros and add the confusion matrix for each uh, ba different batch. And at the end, we have a confusion matrix for the whole data set. This works since each cell in this matrix is just uh, a count of, uh, of how much uh, how how much times we've predicted the class y the class i when the actual class is uh, j, and uh, then we at the end we just show the matrix, and let's see how let's do another training and see how the confusion matrix changes. In in the beginning we have an accuracy of close ten percent, and we can actually see why this is the case. We've predicted uh, the class eight on basically all of the examples, and we get a very good accuracy of 10% just because around 10% of the examples are eights, and we've correctly guessed those uh, examples. And as the training improves, we can see that we gather very most of the examples on the diagonal, which is the the where we want to the thing we want to see in the uh, confusion matrix and there are a lot less examples of the di diagonal and we can see that those examples of the diagonal uh, gradually decrease as examples as the model is trained. And uh, yeah, this is uh, basically the demo of accuracy and confusion matrices. So to go back on the presentation, uh, let's look at why we, there, there are other ma uh, metrics except accuracy. First, accuracy is a very bad metric if uh, we, we want to solve a regression task, for example, uh, predict someone's height, then uh, an, an error of a centimeter or, or an inch is way better than an error of a meter or a foot, since, uh, yeah, th this is basically more accurate pre uh, estimation. Another issue with accuracy is if, if uh, it allows for a single prediction. If, uh, for example, when you go to Google and you Google uh, something, you get uh, at least one page of uh, results. So even if the first link isn't the, the one that, that's right for you, you can find the results in the other links. And to model that, uh, one uh, solution is to make accuracy uh, uh, not return to measure accuracy not in the setting with one result, but make take the a couple of guesses and uh, say okay the this result is correct if at least one of those guesses is correct. Uh, for example, if you get five guesses and if one of those guesses is correct, we say we we got it right. This is called top five accuracy. This is used in uh, the image as uh, data sets and the relevant uh, task as we'll see later in this presentation. Uh, another uh, very popular, very common shortcoming with accuracy is uh, if we have a so-called class imbalance. Uh, here I've linked to a data set that contains uh, credit card fraud information, basically uh, some details of a transaction and uh, labels that say if that transaction is a fraud or not. And in this data set, we have uh, a very, the fraud class is very rare, less than 1% of the examples of fraud. And we can actually get a pretty decent accuracy with, uh, with a basically useless uh, 
uh, rule. If we say that uh, no example is uh, fraud, we get like 99% accuracy just because 99% of the examples are not fraud. And for such exam, and this is uh, basically useless for for solving the task, but we get a very high metric just by uh, using this simple rule. And in order to avoid this, we have to use different metrics. Uh, of, to, to define some other metrics, we usually uh, use the binary confusion matrix, which is taking the confusion matrix as we did in the, uh, in the notebook, but using only the classes, uh, the, the positive and negative class. Or in the example of, uh, of credit card fraud, the, the class fraud and the class not fraud. And we divide, we give names to different uh, parts of this matrix so we can um, be more specific in the way we speak. Uh, for example, uh, the classes we predicted are positive, but uh, and are really positive, are called true positive. And the classes we predict as negative and, and really negative are uh, tr the true negatives. We're basically gaining the, the terminology on the, what we've predicted, not what's the target. And uh, you can see that if we predicted negative, but it's actually positive, it's a false negative, or if we predict positive, but it's actually a negative, a false positive. Using uh, this uh, line of uh, terminology, we can define uh, the so-called precision and recall metrics. Uh, precision is basically taking the true positive and dividing uh, by the number of true positive and false positive. In the, this diagram, diagram here, uh, the full field dots are the fraud and the empty dots are the not fraud. And we outlined with this circle the, what we think is fraud. So basically, if we divide this part here or by the length of this whole circle, we get the precision or what part of the uh, things we said are fraud are actually fraud. Uh, a similar metric is recall, basically taking the, the stuff we've said are fraud and are really fraud and dividing by the number of fraud we had in the data set or how, how big chunk of the fraud we've actually predict, predicted as fraud. Know that these two metrics uh, are uh, have their imperfections. For example, if we say everything is fraud, we get a hundred percent recall, but we might get a very low precision. So usually, usually those two metrics go hand in hand uh, to uh, to inform us uh, how good we are at uh, detecting uh, in this example fraud. Another class of metrics. Is, is used mainly in object detection or object, object localization. In this task, except detecting uh, what we see, we have to uh, say where it is. For example, we have to say where the stop sign here is in this photo. Uh, so we have a bounding box the, that says uh, what is, that's annotated by a person and we have a bounding box that's predicted uh, by someone else. But that's predicted not by someone else, sorry, but by our model. Uh, we don't we don't want to say we're correct only if those uh, bounding boxes match up perfectly, and that's why we use the Jacquard index or the intersection over union coefficient. It's basically uh, computed as follows: we take uh, the two bounding boxes, we compute their intersection. And then we compute their union and uh, we divide the area of their intersection over the union. And uh, we, we can combine this with uh, other metrics. For example, we can define uh, recall at uh, say 50% by counting how, how many times uh, the Jacquard the index is ab above 50% when we're correct uh, and uh, define recall that way. It's a very common way to define uh, re precision to recall for object localization tasks. Uh, let's uh, show a bit behind the scenes how we use metrics at HyperScience. First, I'm going to provide some context at uh, how our product is used in, in the wild. Our clients are mostly big enterprise organizations like uh, banks, uh, insurance brokers, and financial brokers. 
And for them, accuracy is not optional. Like if we ship, say, 50% accurate model for them, it's actually going to harm them instead of helping them. That's why we've uh, created a human in the loop system. That is the model produce, uh, produces an estimate of how uh, good the prediction is. And if the model is not very confident in, in its prediction, we're going to send uh, this task to a human to actually provide a better prediction. And if the model thinks, uh, the prediction is good it goes out, uh, automatically through the system so that way out, uh, we get a bit the things uh, in between the reverse we get like full uh, full good accuracy but not full automation usually uh, if you see then the accuracy how accuracy is measured we get a hundred percent automation for some uh, accuracy that's not a hundred percent and so, yeah, we basically, our customer says, okay, we need this accuracy, for example, 99 or 99.5%. And we measure how much automation we can provide while still achieving this accuracy. And so the more automation we use, the more documents that can proce process uh, automatic uh, without human intervention. And uh, that's how much value they can extract for our product. And uh, this is basically how we, how we measure what this the metric we use in hyperscience we have some derivative metrics but this is a good uh, direction how we define them and uh, another thing uh, that's an another basic class of measurements is measurements that cannot be computed automatically a uh, good uh, example for, for this is the turing test the, uh, the turing test is a test for if if a machine or an algorithm can uh, convince a human being that they're not talking with a machine, but with another human being. And uh, in order to measure and to compute that into a metric, you can basically say, okay, how often you can convince a human that he, he, they're talking to a human and not to a machine. And uh, to compute that percentage, you actually need an experiment with human. You cannot uh, save something in the on, in your database and uh, run a simulation because that uh, every uh, conversation will be different. And uh, so basically, you can have metrics that cannot be computed automatically, but need uh, interactions with uh, living living people to be computed, which can provide more business value that, than automatic metrics, but are kind of expensive to run since you need to invest time in that metric. Uh, another thing uh, we should be mindful when doing metrics is uh, to have a good baseline and to illustrate why we need a notion of baseline to provide some context. I'm going to ask you the following question. Is 98% top five accuracy good for, uh, for the following task, I'm showing you a picture like the picture you see on the right, and I'm asking you what you see in this picture. And it's actually a trick question since uh, this is not that easy task. Uh, most of you have probably said, okay, this is obvious. I see a dog or a puppy on the right, but that's not the not a good, good enough answer since this is image net where we have uh, 1000 classes and 120 of those classes are different dog, different breeds of dogs. So you have to actually guess the breed of the dog. So, and uh, yeah, uh, saying it's dog or, or puppy is not enough. And uh, yeah, the ground rule for this exact image is KLP. And if you guess that right, congratulations, you're accurate. But you, I suppose mo most people are not that familiar with different dog breeds. So to have this nuance and uh, to, to have a baseline that, uh, that has, uh, that's actually measured is a good way to provide context to this 98% figure we used above. So uh, a usual, so let's look at what different models achieve for with this accuracy. An early 2016 model called ResNet, which is quite popular, achieved 94% accuracy. While the state of the art as of uh, a, today or a week ago is like 90, almost 98% accuracy. So 
uh, like we're kind of reaching this uh, percentage, but we're not not actually there. And uh, so to, again, let's ask: Is this good enough, or are those models uh, lacking behind? And to do this, actually, the authors of the data set measured uh, accuracy by asking a person to by first training a person to to do this exact task, and then measuring their performance on a known task. And that person actually achieved 95% accuracy again with five guesses. And uh, it takes them around a, mi uh, a minute on average to uh, classify an image. So we, we can see that on this task, we've seen superhuman averages, uh, uh, superhuman accuracies. So uh, different ways to provide a baseline is, uh, as we said, uh, currently, you, you can look at how good a person will uh, will be on a given task. You can also look at uh, trivial examples as we see in the uh, tri trivial uh, solutions as we see in the fraud detection uh, task, we can get like 99% accuracy just by saying everything is uh, not a fraud. So uh, that usually tells us that either our metric is better or we can uh, provide a good uh, solution using uh, trivial uh, heuristics without using machine learning. Uh, another good baseline is to look at state of the art for a similar uh, task. That is, uh, if you have a similar number of classes or a sim sim similar complexity of the task, this can provide us a good estimate of how, get, how good we can get with our model. And actually the most important baseline is uh, what is the worst metric we're comfortable shipping. As we said in in our hyper science use case, we're definitely not going to ship something that has like 50% uh, accuracy, but we'll be comfortable shipping something that has high, uh, very, very high accuracy. So it's good to know where, where are we compared to the minimum, to the worst, worst model we're comfortable shipping, or uh, if we're not going to get there, uh, we should probably look at some other metrics and uh, discussing. Uh, getting to other metrics. Uh, I want to close the discussion around metrics with uh, saying that you get what you basically get what you measure. So you should be very uh, uh, careful how you choose your metrics since they will shape the project uh, you, you're working on. Uh, you're going to make decisions that will make your metrics go up. So you better measure what is important and uh, if the metric has noise that's not really important, that can add a noise and make you spend time on, uh, on nuance that's actually not important to, to the work you're, you're doing and vice versa. If your metric has blind, spot, blind spots that are missing something important, you should definitely pick a metric that uh, figure, factors them in and uh, otherwise you're going to shift something that has a a uh, very important uh, miss, uh, is missing something very important. And yeah, basically there are a ton of metrics and all of them have different nuances. And with that, I'm going to give the floor to Christo. Can I share my screen as well? Oh, yeah, sorry. Right, so are those metrics that Daniel mentioned uh, good enough? Um, is it really, uh, is it that simple to just take all of the metrics and compute them on the entire data set? And clearly the simple answer is no, that's not correct. And there's usually a more uh, specific procedure that machine learning engineers take uh, to uh, execute this step. Um, the most general idea is to uh, get the entire data set and split it into two parts. The first part should be the training set, so really the data that the model is trained on, and eventually a test set that we can uh, uh, compute our evaluation performance at the very end um, of, the, of the experiment. Of course, a few things to mention here as well. The test set should ideally be kept uh, for the very for the very end, so we can have an unbiased estimation of how good our model is, indeed, and also 
you know, making sure that really both the train set and the test set come from roughly the same distribution. That would mean that they have the, really the same examples that we are trying to, um, to focus on for our current task. Uh, an example of that I can, I can give is um, probably not a good idea to have your train set filled in with uh, uh, traffic sign uh, images that are taken during the day and then try to evaluate your uh, models based on traffic sign images taken during the night. Uh, those two uh, data sets will be taken from the different distributions and you cannot expect really to your model to uh, learn how to distinguish signs uh, during the day and then uh, perform similarly uh, during the night. Um, as you can see in the literature, uh, the test set has some different names associated with it um, and that would be the evaluation set or uh, eval set for short. Here's a quick uh, visual example of how the training and test processes uh, look like. On the left image, you can see uh, all the data points or the small data points um, that are either uh, dark blue or uh, dark orange uh, on the image. And we give this to the, to the model and it will eventually try to uh, come up with this uh, white line separator in the background in, as a uh, as, as, as part of the model to try to distinguish between uh, blue and orange examples. Um, and we can see on the, on the right side, we have the test set. So actually uh, unseen data points uh, that we give the model and try to uh, predict what the outcomes would be. And eventually what our evaluation would look like, we take those data points, see how much of those data points are correctly predicted. And then we use some of the metrics that Danny mentioned in order to, uh, to finish the evaluation process. Um, at the very bottom, you can see a very short uh, PyTorch snippet. This is one way when you can um, split your data set into a training and test set. In particular, um, this example gives you a 80 to 20 split uh, for the training and test. Uh, of course, this, there are other cases that the simple train and test split would not work. Um, imagine the validation set, uh, a case where the, such a thing would call the validation set could work. Um, there, there are certain um, moments when we try to um, evaluate our hyperparameters, model hyperparameters. And for those of you who, have, who haven't attended the last session and don't know what those are, that could be the learning rates or how fast. Uh, the model learns the number of layers that it has, if it's a, a deep uh, a neural network, for example, the number of epochs, so how long should you train your model in order to perform uh, better, etc. So we want those uh, to run some experiments on those uh, hyperparameters. Um, and then, of course, one really uh, straightforward option would be to just uh, train it on the train set and then uh, train a uh, test on the evaluation, evaluation set and then do that over and over again. But that would eventually break the idea, the initial idea that we have that we should leave the test set for the very end when we have done with all the, our experiments and we can say how good our, our model is actually on, on real data or some unseen data. For that particular reason, we set aside uh, the so-called validation set uh, and we use it to run those experiments uh, before coming to the final step when you can evaluate our model. Similar to the test set, it has different names in literature. It's some, things, uh, some, some names you can see, uh, some of the blocks uh, online as well. Uh, these uh, could be the development or the dev set for short or holdout validation set as well. Uh, and here is a visualization of how the process would look like now, not really just training and testing, but you start with training your model on the trace set, then you evaluate how this model with this particular hyperparameter settings would perform on the validation set. Then based on the results on the validation set, you try to change the values. Maybe you wanted to learn slower, you change the learning rate, or uh, you wanted to not, uh, not focus on particular examples. 
and so on. And then eventually when all those cycles of uh, hyperparameter tuning uh, finish, uh, you can proceed on with the final step when you can run the final evaluation on the test set, the whole dot test set. Uh, and of course, with all those three types of uh, data sets, uh, there's certain, a certain problem that appears, and that's, of course, how should we split it? Should we just set aside 10 examples for the test set um, and uh, 10 examples for the validation, and then the remaining thing should uh, stay in the train set? That's not very clear. Um, and I can, I can really tell you that uh, the could be a scenario when all those three very uh, distinct types of splits could actually work very well for your particular problem. So that's why it's not very clear at the very beginning how you should ideally split uh, your data set. Um, and as a reference to the first lecture uh, at Hyperscience Learn that we did uh, uh, this year, um, Ivo uh, back then said uh, that there isn't much data there wasn't much data back in the days uh, when people started researching machine learning or deep learning as well. Uh, so people used to um, do those 60, 20, 20 or 70, 20, 10 splits that worked just fine. And they used it as a rule of thumb back then. But you know, times changed and uh, now we have increasingly more data, even more than we can handle. Um, and it become not only about the ratio, but also about the size. And it's really, um, really makes the problem uh, worse in that sense. And that also in, uh, introduces a, a very uh, interesting trade-off. Uh, of course, you have more training data then your model has the potential to get better. But uh, if you give more training, if more, go more data to the training uh, set, then uh, end up with more data for the uh, evaluation set, which would bring higher uncertainty during your evaluation. Of course, vice versa would also work. If you have a more, a more data for the evaluation, then you might have a more robust evaluation, but then uh, your model might lose some potential for, being, for getting better at the end. So it's really finding uh, what works for you best, uh, looking at the ratio, the size, the specific task you're working on. And now it's time for a short demo. Um, and of course, similar to Danny and uh, last session's uh, Chris and uh, Christos notebook, we're using this, the exact same uh, neural network uh, and also using the MNIST data set. So for those of you not familiar, MNIST data sets include all the, the numbers, handwritten digits that we try to classify into 10 different classes. That would be from zero to nine. Um, those two parts, very just exact same copy of what uh, they did previously. Uh, here, what I do uh, differently is I uh, give you a, a different example of how you can split your data. Uh, into a validation and then train uh, set. Um, then follow, following, uh, we do some sampling in order to not to load the entire uh, MNIST data set for uh, uh, the training process. Uh, then at the very end, and this is where I want to put some more emphasis on, is uh, also something very similar to uh, the notebooks for uh, Danny, Chris, and uh, Christos, but here we have two phases that we execute. The first one is the train set that we saw in uh, the other uh, demos as well. Uh, but what is different here that I had a validation set, a validation phase as well. And what we do in the validation phase is we essentially um, not only uh, back here, we don't only compute uh, the epoch loss for each training step, but you also do it for the validation step. And we keep track in those two lists here in the train uh, loss and the validation losses. We keep track of every single epoch step and we uh, run uh, those epochs for we run 25 epochs and take all those 25 uh, examples into further consideration. And you can see here for each epoch, there is the train uh, and the validation loss. Um, for, for the entire sample of the data set. Um, what's more interesting there, if you plot the entire um, 
the entire result that we have. The blue line here represents the training uh, performance. So the performance of the model on the training set. While here, the orange line would represent the performance that we have on the validation set. And we can see in the very beginning, so the first few epochs that both the validation set performance goes better. So that would be uh, the model loss. So eventually the lower we are, the better uh, we are as well. Um, during the entire process of training, uh, the, the, train, the performance on the train set goes, uh, goes as much uh, as close to zero as possible. While we, our performance on the validation set, so data that the model hasn't seen before, uh, sort of fluctuates and goes down to a certain level and then starts going up. And this is a good moment when we can introduce a, a specific concept. And this concept is called overfitting. Um, for example, when a model starts uh, learning, it learns all the features from the data set that you've given it. Uh, and then at a certain point, it starts to overlearn or, or try to uh, mimic all the noise that's included into the data set. And this is a moment where we should ideally stop training because our model is not uh, learning useful things. And, and a way uh, that we can use the validation set to uh, spot that is um, plotting this uh, figure and uh, looking into the moment where the validation set starts uh, going up. That would mean that the model is not learning anything useful anymore uh, and starts performing worse on the unseen data. Uh, this spot where the validation set performs best and afterwards starts overfitting, would, uh, we call the sweet spot. And just before the sweet spot, this entire region from the, uh, the zero to the sixth epoch, uh, we call that the model is underfitting. So it still hasn't learned all the features uh, that we are looking for in the task at the moment. Um, and just for, uh, just as a quick example, uh, I wanna give you the last five train losses here, as you can clearly see, the train losses goes as close to zero and down to zero as possible. Uh, but then at the same time, the validation loss uh, goes up. Uh, and that's certainly something that we want to, want to avoid. Now, coming back to uh, the presentation, Here's a more clear picture, visual picture of um, how underfitting and overfitting would look like um, on, a, on some example. Here's of course our sweet spot. And when we train the model, we would eventually wanna train it as much as possible without it overfitting. So ideally we would want to stop at the sweet spot. Of course, that's not always uh, that easy. Um, and again, another example, uh, which is more related to a regression task rather than um, uh, a classification as we had with the MNIST data set. On the very left, you can see an underfitted model. So a model that's underfitting at the moment. And the meaning behind that is that we have a very simple model, a straight line uh, that tries to fit uh, some data that has a very uh, specific pattern that is not really that simple. Um, Compared to that, at the very right, we have an overfitted model uh, that might look very good, uh, but essentially is learning too much of the data. For example, if you have uh, another example somewhere here, um, the model should not say with confidence that it's actually part of one of the classes rather than the other. And, and this is uh, essentially the problem with overfitted models. It learns too much of data, it might eventually uh, miss some of the additional unseen points that you give it. Uh, at, at the middle, we have our best uh, candidate. That would be uh, our good fit. Of course, uh, you might start with an underfitted model, a regional overfitted, then you have to get back uh, to reach a, a good fit model eventually. This is uh, what we ideally want to uh, look at. Um, following to that, um, there is um, this problem that might appear of uh, which part of the data set you should uh, 
separate to use as a validation set? Should you use uh, the last 20% of the data set? Should you use the first 20% or so somewhere in the middle, some 20% in the middle? Um, that's not very clear at the first sight. So there is this resampling um, uh, strategy called the cross-validation technique, which we can use to um, run all those, in this case, five experiments and try to see how our model performs on different data set splits. Um, generally, the cross-validation technique is called k fold cross-validation, with k being the number of splits or faults uh, that you uh, want to execute. Um, and there's also a very, I think, very important variation of the cross-validation technique. It's called the stratified cross-validation, with only difference being that um, the stratified cross-validation makes sure that every class is well uh, similarly represented in each of those faults or splits uh, during the validation evaluation. Um, and you can guess that this cross validation would have uh, a bit of a higher burden, uh, computational burden to your task, evaluation task. Uh, but that's, of course, uh, the price uh, you pay for having a less bias estimator. Um, as a, an example of uh, this, to show you how and why it could be an unbiased, less biased estimator for uh, the performance of your models, uh, I'm giving you a, a a very small table here that we try to compare model A versus model B performance. And if we do only one evaluation on the first fault, we can see that the model A clearly has higher accuracy than model B. And we might just decide that this is, uh, this is final and model A could uh, easily prevail model B. Uh, but when we uh, run all the, uh, the experiments on the other folds as well, we can see uh, that um, model A's performance wasn't really uh, constant during those folds. It actually fluctuates quite a lot, has a lot of bias, while model B keeps a steady performance. Uh, and it actually outperforms model A and, and the remaining folds of the data set. So that's why cross-relation can really give you uh, a good insight into why um, and how uh, good your model, model is. Um, so we have all those metrics and all those um, data set splits, so the data that we uh, evaluate on. Uh, but of course, after that, you might get 95% uh, accuracy, for example. And even though 95% might be really good, you might be wondering where those 5% error is coming from. Why is it not 100% accurate, for example? And there's there are usually two general types of errors that appear. And the first one being the reducible error. And, and this is essentially something we can work on. Um, we can improve on that uh, because it's usually based on either the data, the model architecture, 